the innocence is kind of the, almost the last of that classical era of controlled filmmaking in terms of the lighting, in terms of the compositions, in terms of the camera movement, that floating camera. And it was done with the most primitive and difficult equipment, but with the most rigorous kind of discipline. Freddie Francis, starting as a clapper loader in the mid-30s, had become, you know, an assistant cameraman. You know, so, I mean, he, he, was, he was in his early 40s when he became a director of photography. He really understood how precise things had to be. He was an extraordinary uh, black and white cameraman. You know, he photographed Room at the Top with Clayton. He photographed uh, Saturday night and Sunday morning for Carol Reese. So here he was, classically trained in the great studio tradition which he was able to show in The Innocence. When television started to really become popular and the movies had to respond with something, um, one of the responses was to widen the screen, Cinerama. And Fox, Spiro Skouros, the president of Fox at the time, decided to patent an old anamorphic squeeze process that had been uh, developed in 1926 by a French uh, scientist, Dr. Chrétien. So they got the rights to that, and what it did was it, it took a regular uh, picture and squeezed it twice, and then in projection squeezed it back out, and it ended up with a, a format aspect ratio of about 240 to 1. Fox became so convinced that it was the way to release all their films that they mandated that so many films would be made that way. But the, there, were, there were technical problems with the, the CinemaScope lenses at the time. They, it was a dual lens system. There was a regular lens that was traditional, which was, was a spherical lens. And then there was another attachment, which was the Chrétien attachment, which went in front of it and provided the squeeze. And both of those lenses had to be focused separately. It's called a hypergonal system. And the initial, the first generation of them, required two focus pullers. The problem with the, with the uh, lenses were inherent in trying to integrate the anamorphic uh, elements into the regular lens. And what happens is as a character moves closer to the screen, gets larger in the screen, the anamorphic squeeze becomes diminished. It's less effective. So they're less squeezed. So that when it's then unsqueezed in projection, the face starts to get wider in order to maintain the aspect ratio. And th that's called the anamorphic mumps. And you see it a lot in the extreme close-ups in The Innocence. Especially if they're on the edge of the frame, you see this sort of slightly bloated face. I mean, it's not uninteresting, especially for a film like this, you know, that is sort of a gothic film. It's sort of an effective device, even though it's kind of primitive and it was considered a fault. Clayton thought that he and Freddie Francis would be exempt from that mandate, but they weren't. And so they had to come to terms with that. And Clayton had apparently storyboarded and planned virtually the whole film to be done in a more, you know, traditional 137 Academy aspect ratio. In fact, the British standard for so-called widescreen, in America it was uh, 185, the British was closer to the traditional Academy aspect ratio. It was called 166, and uh, as far as I know, England was the only place that did it. And so it was a huge change uh, in, in, in the format. And I think for a lot of reasons, uh, Clayton was opposed to it. Obviously, he saw, I think, uh, the innocence as a, essentially a four or six character, four people and two ghosts, you know, uh, uh, chamber drama. And to have this huge wide frame just seemed to be uh, contrary to the intimacy and especially the kind of sort of gothic claustrophobic f uh, feel that he wanted. And one of the, the solutions uh, that uh, Freddie came up with was in certain scenes to have some glass filters painted on the edges so that it would create a vignette and darken the edges of the frame. And uh, apparently he had uh, about a dozen of these made in different kinds of densities and colors and he had several just plain glass ones that he would paint as needed on the set. And I think it's probably a, uh, an idea that he might have gotten from his friend Jack Cardiff, who had photographed uh, both uh, Black Narcissus and the Red Shoes. One of the things you normally do um, when you want to bring in 
the kind of intimacy and, and drama and establish anything like a kind of paranoia or claustrophobia is you also start to use longer focal length lenses which throw the background more out of focus. They compress the perspective, kind of flatten the picture plane, and it all then starts to become about the, 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 the head, just the presence of that. You know, uh, Clayton and Francis don't really do that. They don't change the focal lengths that much. What they do is, through the use of the filters, is they create the vignettes, but the evolution really is mainly in the lighting. And a film that starts off in the bright of day with her arriving at Bly, she stops and there's an over-the-shoulder shot where you see the folly. And it's all very kind of, you can't say warm because it's black and white, but it's very glowing. And as you more, move more and more uh, into her sense of uh, losing the children and of becoming obsessed with finding out to what extent Miss Jessel and Quint have influence on or are, you know, inhabiting the children. The lighting starts to become pushed in more just on the figures. It becomes contrastier. The walls start to fall off more. The hallways start to get darker. The lighting becomes more sort of uh, centered around them and the edges falling off. It's not so much the actual vignetting of the filters as, as controlling the lighting. And having that extreme wide aspect ratio, you could have your main action in one side of the frame and have in the corners, you could sort of have this thing, do I see it or do I don't see it? You know, and so I, I think that was an advantage of actually having that aspect ratio. And I think that Clayton and Freddie Francis embraced that as they went along. The vignetting that happens are mainly in the night scenes, but in the day scenes and certainly in in the grander scenes um, um, that are done in a more full light, you don't see it at all because there I think it would have been distracting. As a matter of fact, you have quite the opposite. It, look, it looks as if uh, both the director and the cinematographer at some point decided to embrace the, not only embrace the reality of the widescreen, but to actually sort of like take it to as much of an extreme as they could. I mean, there are several scenes where you have people on exact opposite sides of the screen uh, there's a scene near uh, the very end after uh, Mrs. Gross and Flora have gone back to London to see the uncle and Miss Giddens is waiting for, uh, for the boy Miles to come back home. He's been gone during the day and she's carrying a tea, some tea into the room and uh, she's on the extreme left side of the frame. On the right side there's a little open doorway to the outside, Miles enters through that doorway, and it's extreme left and right, I mean really daring, and he comes forward, and the camera moves as he comes forward to kind of maintain that extreme, so that when they finally sit down, you know, for the tea at the, at the end of the scene, uh, they are extreme left and right, and the whole center of the frame is the tea pot. There are compositions like that all the way through. There's another one in The Folly, a day scene in The Folly, when Miss Giddens is trying to talk to uh, Flora, who is playing down outside The Folly uh, in the water. And Miss Giddens is on the right side of frame, and Flora is on the left side. And then you cut to a reverse of it, you know, where you see Flora in the extreme foreground. And it, in American anamorphic films at the time, you hardly ever saw that much of a use of the 2-4-0 aspect ratio. It's intoxicating almost to see how daring they were with these widescreen formats. And the combination of using the extreme left and extreme right of, of the frame combined with the deep focus that they had, you get a, a sense of a tremendous playing area which allows the actors to move very freely in depth and in width. And that combined with this fluid camera, I mean, even though it's a very intimate chamber drama, the sense of movement and dynamic space all the way through the film is extraordinary. When she first arrives, Mrs. Gross, Miss Giddens, and Flora are outside the door. And then you cut to a reverse from inside, a fairly long shot. And they walk in, and Miss Giddens starts to look around. The camera kind of moves and dollies. There's a table with a centerpiece of roses on it and she brushes past the roses and a couple of the petals fall to the ground. 
So she passes there. She turns around. She's marveling, looking around at how marvelous the room is. She's moving. The camera's moving. Then she enters off of that uh, entryway and stairway. She walks into another room, and the camera literally follows her and swings around, comes around from behind, and looks out toward the windows. And what has happened is Flora, in the first room, has left and, and gone outside. You see her way off in the corner frame disappearing. And the second room, as the camera continues and comes around uh, with Mrs. Gross and her, in the distant background toward the end of the scene, Flora comes back in, and it's the same shot. The shot lasts, I think, about two minutes. It's a shot where the camera and the movement of the camera is an absolute perfect correlative to her state of mind and her kind of sense of excitement. You're so attuned to the emotional presence and the potential mystery and, and, and the potential danger of what is going to happen to Deborah Carr to Miss Giddens. You carried, literally carried with her all the way through the film. And she's wearing these long floor length, uh, you know, a dress so that you never see her feet move. So the camera's floating, she's floating, and it gives a kind of sense of suspended, you know, feeling to the whole film. And you see it all the way through with her movement. Every time she moves from one place to another, the camera is just with her. You're constantly in her sort of field of, uh, uh, of emotional state. One of the tenets of the horror genre is the shock, you know, that something springs out, you know, and scares the audience, then you cut to the actor's reaction to that scare. But the important thing is the scare. That's not at all what uh, Clayton and Freddie Francis do in The Innocents. Whenever there is a threat or there is one of the ghosts is going to appear, you see Deborah Carr's reaction to it. For she sees it, not the audience. She reacts, then you cut to her point of view. And in an odd way, it's even more disquieting because then you start asking yourself questions. You know, am I really supposed to be seeing this? You know, I mean, how real is it? The second half of that hide-and-seek scene where the kids have gone hiding and then now Miss Giddens is going to go hiding. So she goes behind the drape and there's a window right there. And there's a point of view shot looking down at her feet, and she sees, you know, the tips of her toes sticking out beyond the drape where the kids could see. So she pulls them back. And then as she you cut back to her face, and she's in extreme close-up on the right side of the frame. And Quint's image emerges. And it's not like he's walking toward the glass, he's floating toward the glass. And it starts in complete blackness, and all of a sudden, he's moving toward her, and it looks, you'd think, well, that's some kind of a process shot. But in fact, he was standing on a little trolley, so he was immobile, so there's no sense of the body moving. He's on his trolley, and it's a very brief shot. He comes forward, and a dimmer light comes up, which lights him out of the darkness, and then immediately it's gone. You know, I mean, it's very subtle. It's a very quick shot, but it's very powerful. As open and as um, expansive as a lot of the scenes are, there are several of the night scenes when Miss Giddens is wandering upstairs with this candelabrum. It's got four candles in it. And there's a very intricate play of the way the light changes. And the effect is that as she's turning, the, the, the candles are either silhouetting her or lighting her, or lighting the walls from a certain angle. In fact, of course, the candles couldn't begin to uh, because of the depth of field required by the, the small aperture. One thing that Freddie Francis did was he had candles made that had multiple wicks, up to four or five wicks sometimes that were all wound together. Now, what it did was it created a huge flame. I mean, you see the flames, and they're like two inches high sometimes. In fact, they're smoking, you know, but it's very effective. It gives you a nominal sense of source. But in fact, there were many electricians with many very tightly focused lamps around the perimeter. 
So as she would turn or move, they would use the dimmers to bring these lights up or down. So if the camera is on a front angle shooting her and she's holding the candles out in front of her, the light coming is straight on from one dimmer. As she turns like off to her left, this light fades out, becomes darker, and a light from off to the side comes on, which is the cross light, which is where the candles would be. As she turns around completely behind, of course, she goes in silhouette, and the side light is off, and the only light that is illuminating her is a backlight that's coming from up high. So on a simple turn from the front to the back, there could be three or four dimmer light changes. And in that era, the actors also understood that a mark on the floor, both in terms of the lighting, a little spotlight coming on, the dramatic lighting that you associate with classic Hollywood movies, if you don't hit the mark, you're not going to be in the light. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, Vittorio Storaro, especially in the Bertolucci films, would do dimmer effects all the time, but he, you know, they were nothing like that. The, the tremendous irony, I think, to the whole notion of uh, the turn of the screw, first of all, and, and the film The Innocence, as being, you know, a horror story, because it defies all of the literary and cinematic conventions we think of, of the genre, you know, of shock, gore, you know, uh, violence. Uh, it's not like that at all. And as a matter of fact, there's an even greater irony that shortly after this film, Freddie Francis became a director himself. And he decided to capitalize on whatever prestige he might have gotten for the Academy Award for Sons and Lovers. So he started directing films, and he thought he'd start off on some low-budget horror films, whatever was offered, you know, Hammer films. A lot of the Hammer films were much more in that blood and gore kind of thing. It's really interesting that as a director, he worked almost completely antithetical to what he had done as a cinematographer. Whereas Cardiff, you know, his friend Jack Cardiff, after Sons and Lovers, he never did another film as a director that had quite that cachet, but he did do some very, very interesting films. The fascinating thing is that both these men, both these great cinematographers who became directors, at the end of their careers, they went back and they became cinematographers again. I can really identify with that because I had a brief flirtation with directing myself in the mid-late 90s and decided I, I did not have the personality uh, to be a director. I wasn't sadistic enough <laughs> from one level. Uh, but but I, I have incredible empathy and understanding of those two men and their decision to re-embrace you know, the craft that they loved so much, especially Freddie Francis when he came back in the late 70s and he did Elephant Man and he did Glory, got a second Oscar for Glory, this one in color. But the highest point of his work is The Innocence. Freddie says that uh, the film he's most proud of, and I think for a cinematographer, uh, it, it's, it's manifestly true. I mean, you look at that film and it, it, there's nothing else quite as magnificent 